Hey everybody, how you doing? Everybody have a good lunch today? I'm not asking you to, uh, to go against what Matthew 6 says, but do we have any people fasting today who are not eating? Anybody? All right, we, come, we don't come to Malibu to, to fast, right? Hey, let's, let's bow our heads. Let's pray just for a moment. Uh, God, thank you for uh, this day, for this place. Uh, for friends, God, this morning, um, just to be able to hear Bob Goff, a guy so full of joy, it's just contagious. Uh, God, I'm looking in this, this room uh, as I looked through here just a moment ago. There are some people I know. I know their names. I know their faces. I know their stories. I know things about them. And there are a lot of people here, and there's, there's nothing I know about them but that you created them. I don't know what emotions they bring into this week. I don't know what kind of highs or what kind of lows they have experienced in their lives over the last few weeks, months, last couple of years. Uh, God, whatever it may be, I just ask for you to have your way with us. Today and this week, may your Holy Spirit touch down in our hearts and transform us and change us and release us from the things we need to let go of and help us to cling to the things we need to cling to. Uh, God, may your kingdom come in our hearts uh, and in this place uh, just as it is in heaven. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Uh, hey, my name's uh, Josh Ross. I was born and raised in Texas. My wife was born and raised in Texas. She grew up in Lubbock. I primarily grew up in the Dallas area. We met going to school in Abilene, and uh, next week we'll celebrate 15 years of marriage. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, on Friday, our oldest will turn 10. My wife did not struggle with turning 25, 30, or even 35. The idea of having a 10-year-old has driven her crazy for the last few weeks. She is a basket case. We got an almost 10-year-old, a 7-year-old boy, and in uh, about four weeks we'll celebrate being in Memphis, Tennessee for nine years. I'm the preacher of the Sycamore View Church. We love our job. We love our city. Uh, we love what God's doing there. Uh, my wife and I grew up in families that were fairly similar. We both grew up in pretty healthy homes. Uh, but when it came around a dinner table, uh, our families did some things different. For instance, my family, I grew up in a family from the earliest age I can remember, whenever the food was placed on the table, you just put salt and pepper on it. No matter what it was, you just put salt and pepper on it. We were a salt and pepper family. So we didn't taste and then put salt and pepper on. You put salt and pepper on, then you start eating. My wife grew up in a family where the only time you put salt and pepper on food is if it didn't taste good. Uh, so my wife cooked me the first meal, this was right after our honeymoon, and guess what I did? I went straight for salt and pepper, because that's what we do, all right? Uh, but for her, she was, <laughs> she was interpreting this as, he, this is the first meal I'm making him, and he doesn't think I, I cook well, all right? So she starts crying, we have this conversation, because I'm a salt and pepper family, she's not. Uh, I don't know if you like salt or not. I don't know if you're one of those people that goes to a steakhouse and you get A1 before you even start eating, all right? I know this. I like the taste of salt. But if I took salt and only poured salt on one part of whatever I'm eating, it's not going to taste very good. I know if I pour salt in my hand and keep pouring salt in my hand until there's a big pile and just take a mouthful of salt, it's not going to taste very well. I know that salt is meant to preserve things. Salt also adds some flavor to things, but salt is at its best when it is spread over whatever it is you're eating. So when you see salt show up in the Bible, Jesus talks about salt in Galatians. Paul talks about salt. Let your conversations be seasoned with salt. Salt on salt isn't very good. It's when salt spreads. It's when salt moves. It's when, it's, it's, it's when it permeates. So I want to talk just a little bit today and a little bit tomorrow about uh, this idea of um, th this idea of global God that we have this God who is who is so big, and in His bigness, God has given this mission to the church. It is so big. You let me, l but let me start with it this way. All right, I feel like I have to do so in a lot of my preaching, especially in a lot of the counseling I do with people, is I find myself convincing people that as big as God is, as enormous as our God is, as glorious and amazing as God is, one thing that we learn about God is God is willing to get really small to connect with people. And I find myself having to convince people of this. Uh, because some people have this idea that God is really big, but God's not very relational or He's not very involved. Uh, and if you don't believe God's willing to get pretty small, this, uh, Jesus was willing to become a little creature inside of a womb to be born into the world. God's willing to get down to our level. When I was in grad school, 
at ACU, we were asked to do this one paper in which we, uh, we had to come up with our metaphor of ministry. Kind of a creative paper. If you had to think about, like, what is a metaphor of ministry? We had people talk about, like, the church is an orchestra. Uh, I remember someone used more like a coach player metaphor. Um, the metaphor I chose to use for my metaphor of ministry was um, a, a crossing guard outside of a school. I don't know if you live close to a school, but I'm, I'm assuming you've probably seen this before. Uh, our kids go to a school not too far from our house. Um, there are six lanes of a road to get from one side where a lot of the parents uh, park to get our kids to school. Uh, we don't have just one crossing guard. We have two crossing guards. They are in orange vests and uh, they they're they're holding their stop signs. And we have two women who run our intersection. And I mean, they will throw down. All right. When cars try to make turns they are not supposed to. They're yelling and blowing their whistle. And one thing these women do is they they walk with the children through the intersection. So it's not like they just stand on one corner and when it looks like they're safe, they don't just pat a kid on the back and say, good luck, you know, you can go now. And they don't stand on one side and just wave people over. It's they walk with them through the intersections. And I chose this as a metaphor of ministry because I think it's how Jesus modeled life. It's how God modeled life. That in God's amazingness, how awesome God is, he was willing to become small, to enter into our lives, to connect with us, to interact with us. And then Jesus was willing to put on display how he's willing to walk with people through the crossroads and intersections of life. And I think the church is at its best. Not when we're just patting people on the back and saying, that's the way to Jesus. Or, hey, come over here to us. We're here and you're over there, but come to us. But then when we are willing to enter into people's lives to go with them where they are. This idea of God willing to get small, to connect with people, really makes sense in places of pain and hospitals. I live in Memphis. There have been a few times that I've walked the hallways of St. Jude Hospital. Um, and maybe I've gone to visit patients. I've been on some tours uh, with other pastors and city leaders. So we just walk hallways and see what they're doing. And there have been times I've s sat down in rooms with parents who've been given news that their, their, their small children aren't going to make it much longer. And this idea of God and his ama how amazing God is. He's running the universe, yet he's willing to come down into a room to be with you right now. This abiding presence of God that is with you. This, this, uh, is, I find myself teaching this to people when they come in my office and they're feeling these emotions inside of them. Uh, uh, Josh, I have this burden in my life, but I don't really find myself being able to pray about it because God's really busy doing other things. Or I've had people come to my office and say, I'm just really frustrated. I'm angry because I'm not understanding what God's up to. And I'm kind of upset with how he's handled a situation, but I don't really feel like I can talk to God about it. And I'm like, do you think God can hear our conversation right now? And if you think he can, why don't you talk to him and trust that his grace can carry you through whatever emotion, whatever question, whatever it is that you're trying to communicate to him. That God is willing to get small to connect with us. I want my boys to understand this. My boys have gotten into rock climbing uh, recently, indoor rock climbing, all right? So you have these 35, 40, 45 foot walls and you climb up the wall. My boys... If you've ever seen the show American Ninja Warrior, they are all about that. They want to be one one day. They think they are one. They create our living room into an obstacle course. All right. Uh, and my oldest started rock climbing. He was a little older, a little more adventurous. He can scale a wall just like that. My youngest was having a little trouble. And what they would teach him is you've got to, you, your, your view has to become small. So you can't look down. And don't look to the left and don't look to the right. You focus on what is in front of you and what's just ahead of you. And when my youngest began to shrink like his worldview, it began to make more sense for him. All right, sometimes God is willing to get small to teach us about his character, about how much God loves us. Uh, and, and God wants our, our view of life to become small so we can be more focused and know what it is we're trying to love. Now, the problem is when our view of God is only small. Uh, when our view of God becomes narrow and it's only narrow, because my experience in life is that when some of my ideas of God become narrow, it's really hard for them. It's really hard for me to break getting out of that narrowness to see God in his bigness, how big God is. Maybe you heard this story out of uh, the Denver Zoo in Colorado. Um, that, that they were building a new exhibit for the polar bear. This was a few years ago. 
And uh, as they were building the bigger exhibit, they put the polar bear in a cage that would be its home for a while until they had the, the larger exhibit for the bear. And in that little place, the polar bear had enough room to take three steps and then turn around. And then could take three steps and turn around. And that was, that, that, that was his life for weeks, for months. And then they set this polar bear free to experience this whole new place to live. And guess what the polar bear did? Three steps, turn around. Three steps and turn around. The polar bear didn't know how to live into its freedom. Have you ever seen people in church who've been set free by God, but they, their view of church or life or faith or God has become so narrow for them. Their theology is three steps, turn around. I don't know how to live into this greater freedom. All right, so God's willing to get small. To connect with us. There, there are times that the church needs a view that is small so we know how to love what is right in front of us. But we can't only do that. We have to have this big idea of God too. All right. Um, John 3.16, sometimes we make it to be more personal. And, and I'm, I'm not suggesting anything is wrong with this. So if you're in a Bible study with someone or, or there's someone who doesn't know Jesus and you sit down with them and you open up to John 3, 16, I, I don't think there's anything wrong with you saying, you know, for God so loved and then have them put their name in the blank. But the power of John three sixteen is God so loved the, the, the world, that the world, that, that God wants the world to come to know Jesus, to, to spread this news to the entire world. Matthew chapter 28 is a, the Great Commission, something we... we we all read. It's in, I mean, any Christian church knows the Great Commission. The Great Commission is not about asking people on the outside to come in. The Great Commission is about the church going. And now it, it struck me a little over a decade ago, because if you open up any phone book, which I don't know if some of you still have phone books, but listen to the ways as churches that we advertise ourselves. And the language we use is stuff like, come be a part of our church, come join our family, come worship with us. I'm not saying all this is bad. I'm just saying when it comes to the Great Commission, the word come and the word go are not synonyms. Right? The message of the church is you go. And I don't know what it would look like for us to put on signs out front of our church. Hey, don't worry about coming to us. We're coming to you. I don't know if that would sound too invasive, but it would get across our communities maybe more of what God has called us to. Like, hey, we will connect with you. We're going to live with such purpose and intentionality. We're going to find you where you are and connect with you there. Uh, let me walk us through the book of Acts just for a moment, because I want us to see what I want to try to do today, and I want to build on more of this tomorrow, is that there are times where God wants people to focus on the church and the health of the church and the growth of the church. And there are times where God wants the church to focus on its local context and uh, how you can be educated on where you are so you can meet people in your communities where they are, and then how God also wants us to have this global perspective because the mission of God is for the good news of Jesus to spread to the entire world. In Acts chapter 1, it goes like this. Acts chapter 1 verse 8, which some people say, you know, this is like the thesis of the book of Acts. In Acts 1 8, Jesus says this message is going to start in Jerusalem. It's going to go to Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. It begins in a small place, smaller place, and it's going to grow and it's going to move to the whole world. That's Acts chapter 1, verse 8. But the first command in the book of Acts is Acts chapter 1, verse 4. And this struck me when I was really paying attention to the book of Acts a few years ago, because I had never noticed this in all the years I had read Acts. The first command in the book of Acts isn't for the church to go and do anything. The first command in the book of Acts is for people to wait for the Holy Spirit to come. When you think of the book of Acts, you think of a lot of action, right? Like the acts of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit moving through the apostles, the Spirit moving through uh, the church. But the first command is, Jesus says, you go wait in Jerusalem. He didn't tell him how long to wait. He didn't tell him exactly what would happen when the Holy Spirit came. Like, how would they know it was the Spirit? He just said, you go wait for this gift to come, and then you'll be commissioned to go out. All right, so before you can get to Acts 1 verse 8 about going to the ends of the earth, you've got to learn to wait on the Lord because sometimes we can get, sometimes what happens is we want the mission, we want the assignment, we want the task. And if we want the mission, assignment, and task, yet, yet we're not willing to wait, we forget who the leader of the mission, assignment, and task is. And sometimes as a church, we want the task. 
but we forget to have our affections stirring for the one who's leading the task. Is this making sense? All right, just some head nods. All right, we good? Uh, I've learned from my good friend Jerry Taylor when there aren't head nods going on, it, it, people aren't getting it, so your talk has to go a little longer, all right? When people are nodding, then you can shrink the time of your message because they're getting it, right? Uh, and usually that's when like, people get all sarcastic, you know, start nodding their heads at everything. So um, what happens in the book of Acts is as this message goes, God begins revealing how global he is and relational barriers begin to break down. Um, before I lived in, in the Dallas area, uh, my dad, his first preaching job was in a little town in East Texas called Crockett, a town of 7,000 people. It's called Crockett because the story goes that when Davy Crockett was traveling to the Alamo, he stopped in Crockett to get a drink of water. There wasn't much in Crockett, but we took a field trip to that water fountain that they said Davy Crockett drank out of years ago. It's a little bitty town, man. We had a Golden Corral, we had a Dairy Queen, and a Sonic. That was about it. When McDonald's came in, they let us out of school to go to the groundbreaking. It was a big deal. And in that town, little town, 7,000 people, it was literally divided by the railroad tracks. White town, white side, black side, little small Hispanic side. This is late 80s, early 90s. Yet I remember on Sunday mornings, my mom would pile the kids in her Astro van. We drove one of those Astro vans, all right? And we would drive around town. And my mother would drive into white neighborhoods and black neighborhoods and we would, you know, back in the late 80s, you didn't, you know, the seatbelt laws weren't really required as much as they are now. We would just pile this Astro van full of people. And I didn't realize at the time how my mother's rhythm was forming and shaping my life. That my mom was modeling for her kids. There's no neighborhood we're not willing to go into because every neighborhood around here, Jesus is already in. And I didn't realize how that was forming my worldview then. I would sit in church with these friends from different ethnicities and different colors of skin, and they came from different places. And I remember when the first African American was baptized in that church. And at the age of 11, maybe 12, I remember having this friend who was Hindu. And the way this church loved on him and he wanted to give his life to Jesus, which led to conversations with his parents because... They wanted them to affirm the decision their child wanted to make and to see this kid baptized into that church and the way the church has rallied around it. And I didn't know then the lessons God was teaching me about the mission of God going and breaking down all kind of barriers to bring people, people together in a community. My wife and I want our boys to know this. We were in a context not too long ago. We went to this uh, college football game. There were 90,000 people there. And we were sitting in a section my youngest boy is seven. And I could tell he was looking around the crowd and he tapped his mom on the shoulder. And Casey leaned down and my little boy Noah said, Mom, did you notice there are only white people around here? And she said, well, I wasn't really thinking about that, but I guess that's true. And my youngest son said, I really like where we live in Memphis, where in going to church at Sycamore View, where there are white people and black people. I really like that. I kind of missed it. And that was the end of the conversation. Yet though those little wins, you know, and, and as a life of a parent when you're like, man, I love that my kid's having this worldview that's going to introduce him to the mission of God. Um, so let me, let me do this just for a moment. If you have notes out, um, let's see here. Draw some of this with me, okay? In, in place of collective, you can put the word the church, all right? Let's just, let's just call that the church. Um, in Acts, in, in Acts, the church is launched right after Pentecost. Acts chapter 2, verse 42. Uh, they devoted themselves to the apostles, teaching the prayer, the fellowship, to the breaking of bread. And the church was created. In Acts 2, 42 through 47, in Acts chapter 4, it said the church had everything in common. The church came together. They formed this tight-knit community. And when you get a tight-knit community that's multi-generational and multicultural, it can be really difficult. Right? But the things of God aren't always supposed to be easy, Right? Um, at Sycamore View right now, one of the challenges we've identified is that over the last decade, our neighborhood has changed a lot. It's become a transient community. Uh, we're kind of on the bridge between urban life and suburban life. So one of the challenges for us is we're not, as, we're not urban enough for some urban people and we're not suburban enough for some suburban people. 
uh, one of our big challenges because it's a transient community is adult to adult connection. I'm sure this is a challenge for many of you too. Helping to connect adults in meaningful ways where discipleship and spiritual formation is happening. We have Bible classes, we have Wednesday night classes, discipleship groups, but adult to adult connection is a challenge. We also have a church that's asking for ways to become more uh, aware of culture and even social issues. So we're listening to this. We don't want the Sunday morning time and worship to become an issue-driven place. We want that to be a place where the good news of Jesus is shared, where all people can come and be introduced to who Jesus is and grow in Him. But about a year ago, uh, with the blessing of the elders, I started hosting these forums at our church. And they're forums that are basically this, healthy atmospheres to discuss sensitive issues. Sometimes you get away from the Sunday morning time, you can get away with certain conversations, right? So uh, we've, we've hosted these where I've talked about diversity and we hosted one, I hosted one a couple of weeks ago that was on faith and doubt. I uh, brought Patrick Mead in from Nashville, did a video with Mike Cope as part of the evening, but had two testimonies that were shared in the life of our church. It's risky sometimes when you ask people to give testimonies. One who gave a testimony that night is a guy in our church who his struggle with doubt is uh, he's, he's a doctor and the whole faith in science has at times drawn him away from God and has also at times drawn him close to God. Did a great job. I asked this young woman, 30 years old, to give a brief testimony because some of her doubt and her questions about faith, doesn't, uh, it's not about God existing or not, but is God good? She's a woman who struggles from mental illness and anxiety. And... Um, she has prayed for years for God to take her anxiety away. And she doesn't, she's like, I, I just feel like this should be an easy thing for God. But to hear her just articulate her faith journey and still her commitment to Jesus. And what we found in these forums is that it's connecting people in deeper ways. It's a beautiful thing when the church begins to connect. All right, because churches need to become healthier and there is this focus on, on us becoming closer, a closer-knit community, a worshiping community, a, a community that takes sacraments seriously, that we realize that the bread and the cup doesn't just connect us to God, it connects us to each other, and we can accomplish so much more together as people who are on a common mission than we can on these solo missions. So uh, up there, there's church. I also want you to draw, if you're taking notes, the word local. Uh, because I think God wants us to be concerned about our local context. Uh, so uh, one thing God taught me a few years ago, and Jonathan Storman and I wrote about this in, in a book we released a couple of years ago. Um, uh, one thing God showed me was, like the, if you think about the most immoral, sinful cities, the most lost places in the first century culture, the places you did not want to raise your children in, do you know what we call those places these days? And the answer is, we call them the names of the book of the Bible, that we ended up naming God led people to name books of the Bible after those, those cities. Like God wouldn't given up on places like Rome and Corinth and Ephesus and Colossae. These were places full of pagan worship and all, all forms of immorality, yet the church became this vibrant community there. And not one time when you read the book of Romans or the book of uh, Ephesians, not one time does Paul say anything like, hey, if you're really serious about your faith, get out of here now. It's too bad for you. Instead, he's equipping the church teaching them how to rely on God, surrender to God, live for God, so that they became salt and light right there in those communities. So you have this local context. Uh, what we did at Sycamore Views, we've had a few prayer campaigns. I've been there about nine years. We've had a few prayer efforts. And we did a prayer effort about six or seven years ago. Uh, and what we did is um, we were just in a place in our church's life where we had committed to staying in our location, realizing there were going to be challenges there. And the prayer we started to pray is, God, help us to love our neighbors the way you love them. Sometimes some of our conf confessions in churches just need to be, we, it's hard for us to love a neighbor because we don't know them. Like, we don't know their names. So how do we just know the people who live around us? So what we did is we took the 38134 zip code, 40,000 people live in our zip code, about 11,000 household, households. For a few hundred bucks, we purchased their mailing addresses. And what we did at church one Sunday morning is we asked members, we had 336 pages of over 30 families, 
And we have people who adopted a page that they would pray over for seven weeks. And there was a theme for each week that we prayed over. At the end of the prayer effort, we sent postcards to everyone in our zip code to let them know, just on one postcard, here are the prayers we've been praying over you and your family. Uh, we didn't say anything about you coming and being a part of our church. It was, hey, here's who we are. We wanted them to know our mission. And we just left an email and we left a number. And all we said was, if you have sensed or felt God move in any areas of your life, of these areas of your life, will you just call and let us know? And we purchased a cell phone from like Walmart because we didn't want to give out like our personal cell phones. And, and people started calling. And, and most of the calls were just people saying thank you. But these relationships began to be formed between our church and our community through an effort like that. We've wanted to, we, we hired an intern a few years ago who just did research of our immediate community so we could be more aware of the needs of how we could interact with people who, who, who live there. Uh, my wife and I live in, I guess, what would be called an underprivileged community uh, in, in Memphis. It's a poor neighborhood. Um, and, and we moved in not with the mindset of, hey, we have what they need. Uh, we've learned there are people in our neighborhood have a deeper love for Jesus than we've ever had. But one thing we pray quite often is God teach us to be better neighbors. Uh, my wife and I, like I said, we've been married almost 15 years. We did not have a pet until a year and a half ago. We travel some. We just, we just didn't want a pet. I didn't want the hassle. I didn't want to have to spend money on a pet, all right? Uh, my wife and my kids, man, they, they broke me a year and a half ago. All right. So finally, we decided it wasn't like I had the decision, but we made this family decision to have a dog. We bought a dog, a little Westie. We live on the corner of a really busy street in our neighborhood, a lot of foot traffic. And we have a small uh, uh, white chain link fence. And we did not realize how that little dog that we named Grizz in honor of the Memphis Grizzlies, all right? We didn't know how that little dog named Grizz was going to become a catalyst for us to meet person after person in our neighborhood because people love dogs. And they stopped by our chain link fence to play with Grizz. Uh, and it has given us this time to, in, to be introduced to people. Um, so on Christmas, we've been living on this side of the neighborhood for about a year and a half. So we've been meeting a lot of our, our neighbors, getting to know them. The day after Christmas, uh, at least in Memphis, a warm front came through. It was like 80 degrees outside. We started playing basketball in our driveway. When we play basketball in our community, the sound can be heard from a few blocks away and kids just come from all over the place. It's, it's pretty cool, all right? So we ended up with about 15 people at our house shooting hoops. And we decided to play a game of knockout. You, don't, you, you may have no clue what knockout is, but you have two balls and you're just in a line and you're shooting free throws and the person behind you is trying to get the ball in before you do. So it's all these kids in my neighborhood who are really good basketball players. And it's my two boys and my wife decided to play with all these other kids. And then across the street came this 17-year-old that we had never met. His name's D'Lo. And D'Lo wanted to play with us. D'Lo was bigger than any other person who was there. We played knockout. Do you want to guess who won knockout? My wife won. <laughs> Casey has not touched a basketball in years, all right? She won. You should have seen these kids in my neighborhood. They were demoralized. <laughs> Their heads were down. They're like, how do we let, let this, this white woman beat us in a game of knockout? It was our first time to meet D'Lo. And D'Lo went home, and we didn't know if we would see him again. That night, I get a knock on my door at 7.05. And the Dallas Cowboys were about to play Monday night football at 7 o'clock. Kickoff was about 7.05. We grew up in Dallas. We're a family of Cowboy fans. So we were ready to watch the game. And somebody knocks on my door, and I look out the peephole, and all I see is this guy holding the Bible. My first thought was I didn't know Jehovah Witnesses go out on Sunday nights or Monday nights, all right? It's like, who is this guy? And then I open the door and it's D'Lo. And I was so torn in the moment because kickoff's about to happen on the TV. And here's D'Lo holding the Bible. And I open the door and D'Lo, and I'm not, this, I'm not exaggerating, had a tear coming down his cheek. And he said, man, can I ask you a couple of questions about the Bible? And can I share with you the story of my life? And I had my first thought, I have to repent of this. My first thought was, dude, how about you go home, write it down, all right? And 
because I really like to read testimonies more than hear them. All right, my first thought was, how can I make this as short as possible to get to the game? But I was like, all right, be fully present in the moment. And I sat down, and D'Lo opened his Bible to 1 John chapter 1, and he said, I was reading this earlier today. Can you explain it to me? And I thought, I've read like this in the book of Acts, right, where someone's reading the Bible, and they're like, can you explain this to me? So we end up sitting down talking about what it means to live in the light and what it means to be a person who flees from sin and just unpacking 1 John 1 with D'Lo. Uh, we're just, Casey and I are trying to have this understanding of local context, how we can faithfully love neighbors, how we can have commitments to love neighbors. And we also are a part of a church that's asking some of those questions, same questions. All right, the last thing. Uh, there's also the global context and a global awareness. Uh, how are we doing on time? Okay. Um, so I think having the church and a local t- context and a global context, because if we're only focused on the church in a local context, we're missing something, right? Because there's also this global context that we need to be aware of. What is God doing throughout the world? How's God inviting the church to join Him in His work throughout the world? Where does the gospel need to spread throughout the world? All right, so, so here's, here's what um, I find myself wrestling with occasionally. What happens if the church is really serious about local context and what it means to be a healthy church, a church that's focused on spiritual formation and growth and health, and we also want an understanding of our local context? What happens when those things mesh, but there's not much of, an, of global awareness? Can you sense some of the challenges that may be formed in your theology and how you think about the mission of God if it looks like this? All right, you don't have to respond to me, but can you, can you just sense in your own life right now? Like, what are challenges if, if that's what it looks like? Now, what happens when you have the church that's focused on the church being a healthier place, a healthier community, and they have a global context missionaries they support, mission work we want to be a part of, but there's no local context. So we, we will send checks anywhere throughout the world, but we don't know the names of the neighbors who live right across the street from the church facility. All right, so what happens when, when that's how we think about the mission of the church and the mission of God? Um, and can you see challenges to this? All right, and, and then what happens when you have people who are locally, they are aware of challenges and they have a local context and they have a global awareness and they're passionate about justice uh, and and compassion and generosity and the poor and injustices, but there's no, there's no community. There's no like Christ-given community that they're plugged into. What happens then? Right, because I'm, I, I meet quite a bit of people, and, I'm, and I know I don't want to just point my f- finger at some of the younger folks, but you have people at a younger age that want to save the world and change the world for about six months all right, because they don't have deep roots that are in anything of substance. All right, and what happens when you have the church and local context and global context come together is I just put the K right there in the middle. I think that's when the kingdom of God begins to make the most sense. I think it's when we are in rhythm with the Spirit, uh, and the kingdom of God begins to come with great power and to be advanced in our communities. All right, so um, let, me, let me pause just for a moment before I bring this to a close, can any reflections, especially on just the last couple of minutes, any reflections on that from your own context? And speak loudly so we can hear you. I don't think I understand the question. Uh, my, my question is, any reflections? As you just saw the last few slides that came up and you're reflecting on that from your own experience, from your own church experience, healthy, Feel free to push back. Yeah, let's go right here and then right here. Well, we've got a new border collie, one-year-old, on a corner, and everyone comes by to talk to that dog, so I need to start talking to some of those people that talk to my dog. <laughs> they love it. Yeah. And I don't use the opportunity enough. Yeah. I think it took us a few months before we realized, oh, my goodness, this could be like of God right now. Like, these are opportunities. Yeah. 
Yes, sir. And that's real. And I'm glad we can just say that, articulate it. That hopefully our, I, I think that's the way global awareness is supposed to work. Even mission trips that a lot of our youth and, and that engaging God in a global context makes us more aware of how we love God with the person who's right in front of us. Would your hand come up? Well said. Yeah, let's get uh, these two right here, and then I'm going to bring it to an end. Yes, ma'am. Mom, you told me to call you mom. Exactly. We just well, met, but I think there we go. Key. Beautiful. Thank you for sharing. Yeah. Last one. Yes.
Thank you for sharing and congratulations. This June you'll celebrate one year of being a, a following Jesus. Yes. Wonderful. We celebrate with you. Um, hey, tomorrow I want to pick up and just revisit these slides just for a few moments and pick up from there and talk a little bit more about the book of Acts and also want to talk through uh, John 20 and 21 with you. So uh, hope to see you back. Hope the rest of the day is good for you. It's good to see you. I don't know you, but because of God, I love you. I love your churches. And may God just continue to grow us in every way. So thanks for being here.